Right, good afternoon, everybody, and a uh, uh, very warm welcome to you all to the first in our series of personal injury talks of 2022. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Martin Porter, and I'm delighted to be joined by Lucy Wiles and Kate Lee to give you a road traffic update, which will focus on questions of liability and also on questions of contributory fault. I'm delighted to take this opportunity publicly to congratulate Lucy who was very shortly to be sworn in as a QC, which is extremely well deserved. I'm going to start with the pending revisions to the um, Highway Code. There's been a fair amount of brouhaha just recently in the tabloid press in relation to this, but I'm going to endeavour to give the lawyers rather than a tabloid perspective. Of course, everyone who uses the roads should know the Highway Code, but certainly lawyers dealing with road traffic collision cases must be familiar with Highway Code, they are bound to feature prominently in all letters of claim, letters of response, pleadings, and of course the deadly question to a motorist in cross-examination, are you familiar with the provisions of the Highway Code? I possibly do not need to remind you that the Highway Code has a somewhat intermediate position between legislation and government guidance. Uh, the Road Traffic Act 1988, Section 38, provides that a failure on the part of a person to observe a provision of the code does not render that person liable to prosecution, but that failure may, in any proceedings, and that includes civil proceedings, uh, be relied upon by any party to the proceedings extending to establish or maintain any liability that's in question in those proceedings. Since this is the personal injury rather than the criminal group, uh, we are um, going to be primarily involved in the establishing or negatively any liability in civil proceedings. And the code is, of course, significant and important, not only with determining questions of primary liability, but also questions of contributory negligence. And many of you will recall that the Highway Code was relied upon by the court here in the case of seatbelt case, Proven Butcher, as justifying contributory negligence for failure to wear a seatbelt before that was the law, but after it was recommended in the Highway Code. So, how have we got to these amendments? Well, um, the Road Traffic Act provides that the Secretary of State, currently Grant Shapps, may revise the Highway Code in such manner as he thinks fit. The only qualification to that being that he must put his proposed changes before both Houses of Parliament, and they won't take effect until the expiration of 40 working days. Well, the Secretary of State duly laid the proposed amendments before Parliament on the 1st of December last year, and since there's been no resolution from Parliament, and there won't be one tomorrow, uh, they will therefore come to effect on Saturday, 29th of January, that's eight weeks plus two bank holidays later. It is to be hoped they will then be published, well, they will be published, because the Secretary of State is obliged to publish them. It is to be hoped even more that they will be um, properly publicised. This is the first major revision of the code since 2007. It follows a detailed consultation on the part of the Department of Transport, which was consulting on um, changes to improve the safety for pedestrians, particularly children, older adults, and disabled people, cyclists, and horse riders. It's important, uh, said the consultation, that these groups feel safe in their interactions with other road users. Uh, they go on in the consultation document to explain that a full scale revision of the highway code was likely to take place following the advent of new technologies. So, the consultation announced in October 2018, they've been talking about this for two and a quarter years. Considerable credit goes to the large number of groups representing pedestrians, cyclists, and horse riders for pushing for these changes. And I know there's been substantial work by various groups, including, and this is a declaration of interest, including some. With which I'm associated. Uh, the full scale revision will uh, no doubt involve a thorny issue around liabilities relating to self driving vehicles. And um, I look forward to um, lecturing you on that um, revision when it comes out, probably not for some years yet. Now, I cannot, because of the constraints of time, cover every change in the, um, in the code, but I hope this will be. A, sufficient for whistle stop tour of the more important ones. The introduction of the Highway Code. 
has changed. So it gets off to a good start. The uh, gone is the be nice to each other mantra, which whilst well meaning rather overlooked the differing destructive potentials of um, individuals on our roads and in with supporting healthy, sustainable, efficient transport systems. So particularly encouraging walking and cycling. This is all done uh, principally through the introduction of uh, centres on a new hierarchy of road uses. This is very much borrowed from the from countries not very far to the east of here, uh, where cycling in particular has become culturally more acceptable to ordinary people in ordinary clothes. And those of you who do cross-border litigation will recognize echoes of European systems, although the code has not, of course, could not, because it's not legislation, go the full way towards a strict or presumed liability. A new H1, you'll see from the slide, those in charge of vehicles cause greatest harm uh, in the event of collision, bear the greatest responsibility to take care and reduce the danger they pose to others. So the priority is generally smaller to bigger, pedestrians greater than cyclists, greater than horse riders, greater than most cyclists, greater than car drivers, greater than HGB drivers, presumably greater than GT tanks. But see also new rule 204, in any interaction between road users, those who can cause the greatest harm have the greatest responsibility to reduce the danger or threat they pose to others. A couple more new rules labeled H for hierarchy. H2, everyone needs to watch out for pedestrians. Horse riders give way to cyclists on a parallel crossing. Uh, conversely, cyclists give way to horse riders on bright lanes. Uh, H3 reflects the turning the corner um, campaign, the initiative of British Cycling, and in particular Chris Boardman. Essentially, if you are going straight on a bicycle, you have priority. Hence, H3 drivers and most cyclists should not cut across cyclists or horse riders who are going straight. Though, note the revised Rule 67, which gives advice to cyclists that they must be cautious when passing to the left of large vehicles, particularly when approaching junctions. But new rule 76 uh, makes clear reinforces that there is priority for cyclists going straight ahead of the junction. So it wouldn't be good enough for a vehicle driver not to look carefully to their inside before turning left. As I've mentioned, the new hierarchy borrows from experience in other countries uh, broadly it can be thought of as codifying civilized conduct. And we've come much of the way of the common law, we've advanced much of the way to this point in any event. And I cite an example of the Court of Appeal decision, Megera Macintosh in 2017. Team, Tracy, uh, that should be LJ, by this type, um, held it was appropriate for the trial judge to take into account the causative potency of an HGV, given the likelihood of very serious injury to a cyclist in the event of collision. The judge was entitled to find that it was potentially a very dangerous and she incised the bulk was such that in the event of collision, it constituted a very serious danger to a person in the position of claim. So the code perhaps builds on that. The bigger the threat, the bigger the responsibility. And that's so uh, into the primary liability for contributing fault. Rule 19. Um, changes the rule on zebra crossing. It's always been the case that you must give way to zebra crossing. It's still the case you must give way to a zebra crossing to a pedestrian on a zebra crossing once the pedestrian is on the pedestrian crossing. But in now the rule now adds that drivers and riders should give way to pedestrians who are waiting to cross. Uh, this applies also at junctions. New rule 206. When turning at road junctions, you should give way to pedestrians who are crossing or waiting to cross the road into which or from which you are turning. Uh, I've certainly had cases, many of you that have done where contributory fault has been alleged against pedestrians who stepped out onto the road when going straight ahead into the path of the car. It will be much harder than it has been in the past to allege contributory against, negligence against those. Uh, Rule 52, I mentioned horse riding. We do a lot of horse cases. In these chambers and these rule changes do benefit horse riders as well. 
and uh, Rule 52 about encouraging the British Force Society training uh, implies that those who comply with such training are unlikely to be criticised by court. Everybody's old favourite, Rule 59, clothing for cyclists, has been amended somewhat. This is um, something of an old bugbear of mine, and I've given many talks devoted exclusively to Rule 59, and in particular, the advice on cycle helmets. The advice to wear remains, but the text is modified, and the assertion relating to causation, in particular, is modified uh, to rather, rather weaken the old rule. It now reads, evidence suggests that a correctly fitted helmet will reduce your own risk of sustaining head injury in certain circumstances. And anyone who does a lot of cases of this sort will know how difficult it is for a defendant to, in particular, discard the burden of proof, which rests on the defendant in contributory negligence allegations, that the wearing of a helmet would have made any significant difference. Rule 59 goes on, it's minor changes to the advice in relation to light coloured fluorescent clothing during the day, reflective clothing at night. Advice is altered now to say that these can help other road users, other than that they necessarily do. They don't perhaps help if another road user hasn't looked. Note, please, there is still no advice in the Highway Code for cyclists to use daytime lights. And there's no change in the advice to pedestrians, which remains as it was in the previous version, rule three, help other road users to see you. Rule 61 uh, reinforces the voluntary nature of cycle facilities and says in particular that cyclists may exercise their judgment and are not obliged to use them. That's much clearer than the old, uh, excuse me, that should be the old rule 61, which, uh, which, which said use such facilities are less unsafe and added that they weren't compulsory. Uh, this should prevent cases such as that of Arby Cadden from a few years back, when a cyclist was initially convicted of inconsiderate cycling for failing to use a nearby cycle lane and that had to be overturned on appeal. It should also, in the civil context, help with cases like Group Captain Tom Barrett and Luca. And that was the case about the RAF commanding officer at Norfolk, who was run down using the A40 dual carriage lane and contrib was alleged against him for not using a nearby cycle track. Those of us who uh, ride in groups, um, which is inherently safer than riding individually, well, there's now a specific sanction of riding to arrest. The old rule, never ride more than to arrest, has been replaced with a more clear cut. You can ride to arrest, and it can be safer to do so, particularly in larger groups. It goes on in the final sentence. To say, be aware of driving behind you and allow them to overtake, for example, by moving into single file or stopping when you feel it's safe to let them do so. This last sentence, as I've noted on the slides, came late in the consultation process. It's very unlikely to impact civil proceedings given the hierarchy. But after all, if you don't stop, the vehicle behind will not be able to squeeze through while complying with the overtaking rules that I'm now coming to. Rule 163 about overtaking uh, amended in two major respects. Firstly, it expressly authorizes filtering, albeit with caution, so there's no longer any doubt about the legitimacy of doing that. Uh, but more importantly, there is, for the first time, some guidance about the uh, natural distance to be allowed to uh, a cyclist when overtaking. So the code now provides that motorists should leave at least 1.5 metres when overtaking cyclists at speeds up to 30 miles an hour, and more space when overtaking at higher speeds. Uh, more space is unhappily not specified, but I venture to suggest that would be two or two and a half metres rather than, say, 1.6 metres. This will unquestionably help the police who follow the lead of the West Midlands traffic officers who conduct close pass operations. Uh, they can now pull measures over and point specifically to provisions of the highway code. Um, also, passing horse riders that has been done even slower at even greater 
distance, that for obvious reasons. And then the next slide, uh, two meters of space and low speed when passing pedestrian who is walking in the road. Uh, query whether six inches from the elbow of the pedestrian is on a narrow pavement. Okay, I venture to suggest not, but that's not specifically covered by the UK. Uh, overtaking. Um, give extra space, that is to say, more space than has been specified in the preceding parts when um, overtaking people in bad weather, including high winds, or at night. So the inference from that is we need to be more than one half meters up to 30 miles an hour uh, when overtaking at night. Finally, you should wait behind and not overtake if it is unsafe or not possible to meet these clearances. So you say behind, even if you think it's safe and you can't meet the clearances, uh, it's very important cycling is perceived by those who wish to try it to be safe on a subjective basis. Next rule change relates to roundabouts. There's some added wording about giving priority to cyclists on roundabouts. Um, sadly, quite a lot of conditions appear to happen on roundabouts. I've certainly done a lot of roundabout cases personally. Safest approach for a cyclist is to position yourself as you would if driving a motorized vehicle, but that is too intuitive to a significant number of people. So they're advised to go around the outside of the roundabout, which of course puts them potentially into conflict, and each exit of the roundabout that they're not taking. But um, motor traffic is expected to keep clear of them. Finally, we have some recognition. I mean, finally, at long last, rather than I've nearly finished, that we have some recognition of the positioning adopted by cyclists. It says on narrow sections of road, quiet roads, or streets, road junctions, and slow traffic, cyclists may sometimes ride in the center of the lane rather than towards the side of the road. It can be safer for groups to ride to abreast, allow them to do so for their own safety. Sure, they can be seen and be seen. Cyclists also advised to keep at least one meter out from any part of vehicles. Um, compare and contrast that with the much stronger advice in the Department of Transport approved bikeability and the accompanying book, Cyclecraft, about the primary riding position. Essentially, bikeability teaches cyclists to ride in the center of their lane, that's to say the primary position, unless it is safe to move over towards the Facilitate overtaking, but never go too far. And no further than in an urban environment, such as in London, the cyclist is very likely to remain in the centre of the lane, given that you are always the outer road junction. So the highway code, for the first time, it spells out that this is an acceptable practice. Rule 239, Dutch Reach, has a new rule uh, advising that you should open your car door. You're inside the car, obviously, with the hand opposite to the with the hand that's furthest away from the door that you're about to open. Philip Hammond, the former transport secretary, thought this was a ridiculous idea, but we've all come across those unfortunate dooring type cases. And this does help and does eventually become ingrained habit, as with motorists in the Netherlands. It will be much harder now, I suggest, for a motorist to say, I did not see you, uh, if that motorist failed to adopt the Dutch reach. Tiny sweep up in the annex. Uh, it's recommended you fit a bell because you should fit a bell. I'll just leave that there. In 35 years, I've yet to come across a collision that might have been avoided by the use of a bicycle bell. But I suppose, in fairness, it can be used, a useful tool to politely indicate one's presence to pedestrians on shared space. And then so too is talking to them. It's good, no doubt, the bell manufacturers. Uh, finally, from the annex, bikeability is now recognized in the highway code. So if you're riding in accordance with bikeability, uh, you should not be criticized by any call. So overall, to wind up, broadly, this is very positive. Pedestrians, cyclists, and horse riders. It's not perfect. The bits about stopping um, when uh, necessary to allow someone behind to overtake are, are not ideal and may give rise to episodes of road rage. The rule 59 on cloning will continue to differentiate us 
from the Netherlands, but we have a step, maybe even a stride, in the right direction. And with that, I shall hand over to Kate. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm now going to talk to you about contributory negligence and drunkenness, and specifically the Court of Appeals decision last November in Campbell and Advantage Insurance. The case raised the issue of whether a drunken passenger can rely on his or her own drunkenness to avoid finding contributory negligence in an accident caused by a drunken driver. The very sad facts of this case were that the claimant, Niam Campbell, is an unrestrained backseat passenger in a vehicle driven by his friend, Dean Brown. Mr. Campbell and Mr. Brown had been drinking together in a nightclub, together with Mr. Brown's brother, Aaron Brown, after which Dean Brown set out to drive himself and Mr. Campbell home. To make things simpler, from now on, I'm going to refer to Aaron and Dean by their first names, um, but no disrespect is intended. Both Mr. Campbell and Dean were very drunk, and during the journey home, there was a serious collision with the lorry traveling in the opposite direction. Sadly, Dean was killed in the collision. Mr. Campbell's head collided with the back of the driver's seat and he suffered catastrophic brain damage. Proceedings were brought by way of his father as his litigation friend. Aaron, who was not in the car at the time of the collision, sadly took his own life before trial. Advantage, who were Dean's insurance company, admitted liability for the accident, but contended that Mr. Campbell's damages should be reduced. Firstly, because he was not wearing a seatbelt, and secondly, because he had allowed himself to be driven by Dean, who had obviously been drinking to excess. At a trial in March 2020, there was no direct evidence given. Dean had died in a collision, and Mr. Campbell was unable to give evidence due to his brain damage. Aaron had given witness statements to both parties, but he had died by the time of trial. His Honour Judge Robinson, sitting as a judge of the High Court, found that although Mr. Campbell was not wearing a seatbelt, this had no cause to effect because he would have suffered catastrophic head injuries in any event. So he didn't make any deduction on that basis. However, the judge found that Mr. Campbell should have appreciated that Dean had drunk too much. The judge made a 20% reduction for contributory negligence on that basis. This was challenged by Mr. Campbell and the Court of Appeal therefore needed to decide the following four issues. Firstly, whether the judge had wrongly applied the test of capacity under the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Secondly, whether the judge's findings of fact were properly made. Thirdly, whether the judge wrongly applied the test of objective, reasonable, competent and prudent passenger when Mr. Campbell was too intoxicated to be held responsible for his actions. And fourthly, whether the judge's assessment of 20% contributory negligence should be reduced. Before addressing each of these issues, it's important to look at the detail of the judge's findings, as it's the detail which is central, I think, to the ultimate decision in this case. On the night in question, Mr. Campbell started drinking at about 8.30 or 9pm. At around 10pm, Dean arrived and both of them then went to Aaron's house. All three of them left for a nightclub in Mr. Dean's three-door car, and they passed about five minutes to the club. The judge found that all three men drank equally at the club, and they drank a lot. By about one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Campbell was extremely drunk. Bouncers were removing him, and he was unable to stand on his own. Aaron and Dean walked Mr. Campbell back to the car, and they put him into the front seat of the car. Mr. Campbell passed out. The other two went back to the club to continue drinking. An hour later, Aaron and Dean returned to drive home, but the car wouldn't start. Aaron went to try and find jump leads, and when he returned, the car had gone, with Dean and Mr. Campbell in it. Thus far, the judge had the hearsay evidence from Aaron to go on, but then this is the important bit. Aaron had left Mr. Campbell in the front seat of the car, but by the time the accident happened, Mr. Campbell was in the back seat. There was no evidence of what had happened in the intervening time period, so the judge needed to piece together the events himself. The judge found there were two possibilities. Either Mr. Campbell had woken up or Dean had moved him into the back seat. The judge found it was likely that Dean wanted to move Mr. Campbell into the back seat so that Aaron, when he came back, could get into the front seat of the car. 
Otherwise, he would have had to have climbed over uh, Dean or Mr. Campbell. It was unlikely, said the judge, that Mr. Campbell could have sobered up sufficiently to manoeuvre himself into the back seat alone. He must therefore have been assisted. However, Mr. Campbell was sufficiently heavy and sufficiently tall that he must have been awake as he was being moved, because it would not have been possible for Dean to move him into the back seat of the car without assistance. Ultimately, therefore, the judge found that Mr. Campbell must have been aware of what was happening. He consented to remaining in the car as it was driven away by Dean at a time when he was aware that Dean had consumed so much alcohol that his ability to drive was impaired, and his ability to drive safely was impaired. The judge applied an objective test and found that a reasonable man in Mr. Campbell's shoes would have concluded that Dean was not safe to drive. Accordingly, it was inevitable, said the judge, that finding the contributory negligence needed to be made, which he assessed at 20%. The first issue for the Court of Appeal was whether a proper reference to the Mental Capacity Act had been made. However, this is slightly something of a red herring. The issue of capacity arose on appeal because the judge had found that the presumption in favour of capacity under the Act was not displaced by Mr Campbell having drunk more than the other two men. That conclusion was appealed by Mr Campbell. In the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Dingerman observed that it was unsurprising that the judge had addressed the position under the Mental Capacity Act, given that the particulars of claim contained the statement, well knowing that the claimant was unable to reach a capacitus or informed decision. There was, however, said the system, no error of law in the judge's decision. In his short concurring judgment, Lord Justice Underhill explained that a reference to the Mental, Mental Capacity Act was not necessary or even particularly useful, albeit he agreed with Lord Justice Stingman that there was no error of law in the judge doing so in this case. Accordingly, it seems clear, I think, that consideration of capacity under the Mental Capacity Act 2005 or even under common law, is unnecessary in drunken passenger cases. That was simply a tangential issue that had been thrown up by the feelings. The next issue for the appellate court to consider was whether the judge had impermissibly speculated about how Mr Campbell came to be in the back of the car. The Court of Appeal adopted the ordinary approach to appeals against findings of fact, that is, whether the findings of fact were perverse in light of the evidence available to the judge or whether there was any justiciable error in the judge's decision. Ultimately, said the Court of Appeal, this was a case where the evidence was sadly lacking. The judge had identified two ways that Mr Campbell could have got into the back seat, and it was important to note that the alternative method, um, so if Mr Campbell had changed seats by himself, that alternative method would hardly help him. It was not right, said the Court of Appeal, for other possibilities to be considered. For instance, a group of passing people stopping to assist Mr. Campbell into the back seat at two o'clock in the morning so that he could be driven away by an obviously drunk man, which was the claimant's suggestion. There was no evidence to support that, that contention, and instead, the Court of Appeal concluded that the judge's finding was based on the facts and he had not strayed impermissibly into speculation. The third issue is perhaps the most important issue and the one most likely to be of assistance to personal, personal injury practitioners in the future. On appeal, those acting for the claimant argued that the judge had wrongly applied an objective standard when assessing whether Mr Campbell was guilty of contributory negligence. They referred to a de decision from the Queensland Court of Appeal in Australia called McPherson and Whitfield. In that case, the court said that passengers who had agreed to be driven by a drunk driver were not at fault if they could not appreciate the implications of their agreement to be driven by the drunk driver at the time of agreeing to be driven. This was, said the claimant, consistent with the decision of Mr Justice Watkins in the English decision of Owens and Brill. The Court of Appeal in Campbell starts by reminding itself that under the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act 1945, the word fault in section one of the Act meant negligence, breach of statutory duty, or other act or omission which gives rise to a liability in tort. Now, of course, the test of whether someone has breached a duty of care and negligence is an objective standard. It's that of the reasonable and prudent man or woman. That standard would, of course, apply to Dean as the driver. Advantage, as Dean's insurer, would not be able to rely on his drunkenness as a defence to claim. 
the starting point, therefore, was that there was no principal reason why a different standard should be applied to Mr Campbell when assessing whether he had been contributory negligent in agreeing to be driven by Dean. Moreover, said the Court of Appeal, in Joslin and Berriman, which was a high court uh, decision from the Australian High Court, um, the court had disapproved of the line of cases, including McBurst and Whitfield, instead emphasising that an objective test should be applied to the drunk passenger who agreed to travel with a drunk driver. Owens and Grimmel was an English case where the issue of contributory negligence for a drunken passenger accepting a lift from a drunken driver was considered. Passenger and driver had been on a pub crawl together and had drunk eight or nine pints. On the way home, the driver hit a lamppost and the passenger suffered serious injuries. A reduction of 20% for contributory negligence was made. Those acting for claimants in the present case sought to rely on a particular passage in Owens and Grimmel, um, which I put on the slide. Um, and they sought to rely on this passage to argue that there were only two bases for contributory negligence for a passenger. Firstly, where a passenger, although they have had some alcohol, is still able to process the risks. Or secondly, where a prior agreement is made between driver and passenger for the passenger to be driven later on before the passenger then drinks to excess so that he or she cannot process the risks. The claimant submitted that there is no such agreement in this case on the judge's findings and that neither category therefore applied here. Unsurprisingly, the Court of Appeal dismissed this argument. Owens and Grimmel was not to be read so strictly. In fact, in that case, Mr Justice Watkins himself had emphasised the fact-sensitive nature of the inquiry. He had expressly found it to be more likely that the passenger had not given thought to the risks before the pub call started. And by the end, both passenger and driver were equally befuddled by drink, so as to rid them of their clear thought and perception. Nevertheless, Mr Justice Watkins made a finding of contributory negligence in that case. The Court of Appeal also referred to the case of Booth and White, um, which I've put on the slide. In his concurring judgment in Campbell, Lord Justice Underhill agreed that it's now clear that the claimant's drunkenness will not be a relevant characteristic in deciding whether he or she took reasonable care for their own safety. He cited with approval um, paragraph 453 of Charlesworth and Percy, um, which I've placed on the slide for you to refer to. But, said Lord Justice Underhill, the best explanation of the law, and I think the reason why the judge's findings of fact are likely to be so important in each case, was a paragraph from the Australian decision of Joslyn and Berryman, which he quoted in full. Um, and I'm going to read that out. It states, Hence, the issue is not whether a reasonable person in the intoxicated passenger's condition, if there could be such a person, would realise the risk of injury in accepting the lift. It is whether an ordinary reasonable person, a sober person, would have foreseen that accepting a lift from the intoxicated driver was exposing him or her to a risk of injury by reason of the driver's intoxication. If a reasonable person would know that he or she was exposed to a risk of injury from accepting a lift from an intoxicated driver, an intoxicated passenger who is sober enough to enter the car voluntarily is guilty of contributory negligence. The relevant conduct of accepting a lift, a lift from a person whose driving capacity is known or could reasonably be found to be impaired by reason of intoxication. So Lord Justice Samuel explained that alcohol is not altogether irrelevant. A person who has passed out from drinking too much and who is put unconscious into a vehicle will not be guilty of contributory negligence, since they have done no voluntary act. They simply haven't consented to being driven. And, and this is the tricky bit, Lord Justice Underhill said that there may even be cases where a person who is not totally unconscious may nevertheless be in a state where they are incapable of making a decision. Ultimately, it's the difference between drunken consent and no consent. So if Dean had driven off when Mr. Campbell was passed out in the front seat, it might, said Lord Justice Underhill, be difficult to find that he had consented to being driven. But of course, that's not what the judge found. The judge found that Mr. Campbell was aware of what was happening. He consented to remaining in the car while it was driven away by Dean at a time when he, he being Mr. Campbell, was aware that Dean had drunk to excess. <laughs> 
Finally, the Court of Appeal reiterated that the apportionment of responsibility is, as we're making findings of fact, very much a matter for the trial judge. The appellate court can only interfere where judgment exceeded the ambit where reasonable disagreement was possible and the court below had gone wrong. That had not happened in this case. So what can we take away from the Court of Appeal's decision in Campbell? First of all, it's the latest in a long line of cases which exemplify the appellate court's reluctance to disturb both the judge's findings of fact and apportionment of contributory negligence. In terms of the law itself, there are two particular conclusions to note. First of all, the question of capacity is unlikely to be irrelevant. While it's not an error of law to refer to, to capacity as such, it's a distraction from the central issue. Secondly, while certain characteristics will always be taken into account in assessing contributory negligence, for example, age and possibly disability, when it comes to the drunken passenger, the test is that of a reasonable and prudent, sober man or woman. But that's not to say, of course, that a passenger's drunkenness is irrelevant. In each case, the court needs to make a judgment call in respect of whether the passenger voluntarily consented to being driven and whether they were capable of doing so. An unconscious person clearly cannot consent, but it's clear from Lord Justice Underhill's judgment that nor can those who are not totally unconscious, but may nevertheless be in a state where they are incapable of making a decision. Now, I think that sounds to me like the right approach in the abstract. I think in practice, that distinction could prove very difficult. And clearly, it comes down to the individual facts of each case. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Lucy. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be following on with the issue of contributory negligence, um, but I'm going to be looking at cases where children are concerned. In particular, uh, I'm going to look at the recent Court of Appeal case of Goon and McDonough, but I'm also going to look back at some other recent cases dealing with this issue. So slightly unusually, I'm starting with the newest case first. And as we all know, with road traffic cases, every case depends on its own facts and authorities are of limited assistance. But nonetheless, it may be illuminating to consider how judges approach this particular issue, uh, which can engender emotion and particular uh, considerations. So some of the issues that come up when dealing with contributory negligence in children. First of all, it's well established that the degree of care to be expected must be proportionate to the age of the child. Obviously, that means the older the child, the more care should be expected. And how you work out in any particular case what degree of care is to be expected from, for example, a nine-year-old child is a matter of fact for decision on the evidence. One of the questions that comes up is whether there is a minimum age for a finding of contributory negligence. When you're talking about someone who's five or six, is it realistic that there's going to be any finding of contributory negligence if they run across the road without looking, even if they do know the Green Cross code? And at the other end of the scale, a 16-year-old or 17-year-old is very unlikely to be treated in respect of contributory negligence any differently from an adult. And the Court of Appeal case of Tadean, Hubble and Coles, in which Ben Brown and Roger Harris of these chambers acted, is a good example of that in relation to a 16-year-old cyclist who was treated no differently from an adult. And the other issue that comes up is whether there is some sort of minimum or maximum percentage for contributory negligence if a finding is made. And that's not a question that's limited to children, of course. I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've advised clients or said in a negotiation that there's no prospect of a reduction for contributory negligence of 90% or similarly of 10%, because that's not what judges tend to do. Let's just remind ourselves briefly of the statutory framework that those judges should be applying. And Kate just mentioned section four, which deals with the uh, definition of fault. But section one one of the Law Reform Act 1965 is the provision which stopped it being a complete defence to a claim and turned it into a sharing of liability. And of course, what you need uh, is a finding that any person suffers damage as the result partly of his fault. And then the damages recoverable shall be reduced to such extent as the court thinks just and equitable, having regard to the claimant's share in the responsibility for the damage. 
So you need fault, causation, and then a reduction which is just and equitable. And then Davison Swan Motor, uh, or Justice Denny as he then was, explained that the amount of the reduction doesn't depend solely on the degree of causation. Causation is the decisive factor in determining whether there should be any reduction, but the amount of the reduction is such an amount as may be found to be just and equitable, having regard to the share and the responsibility. So this involves a consideration not only of the causative potency of a particular factor, but also of its blameworthiness. So when you're considering the reduction, those are the two ingredients. And as we'll see, the degree of blameworthiness comes very much to the fore when considering child claimants. And then in Goth and Thorne, Lord Denning gave some guidance specifically in relation to children and contributory negligence in his customary lapidary style. He said that a very young child cannot be guilty of contributory negligence, an old child may be, but it depends on the circumstances. A judge should only find a child guilty of contributory negligence if he or she is of such an age as to be expected to take precautions for his or own, her own safety, and then he or she is only to be found guilty if blame should be attached to him or her. The child has not the road sense or the experience of his or her elders. He or she is not to be found guilty unless he or she is blameworthy. And perhaps some slightly unhelpful language there by referring to guilt as opposed to blameworthiness. But any, anyway, having reminded ourselves of the legal framework, we come now to the very recent case of Gulen McDonough, which was an appeal on the issue of contributory negligence. The claimant was a 13-year-old boy who was struck by a car while he was crossing the road. The first defendant, Mr. McDonough, had driven off at speed when he was approached by police in relation to his suspected criminal activity. And he was driving at at least 40 miles an hour on a residential road with a 20 mile an hour limit. At first instance, the judge noted that the boy was wearing headphones. It wasn't suggested that that in itself was negligent, but the judge said that when a person who is wearing headphones attempts to cross the road, it becomes more important for them to take a careful look at the traffic because they cannot rely on their hearing to warn them of danger. And the judge held that a reasonable 13-year-old making a careful assessment would have realized that that car was being driven much faster than usual, would have waited for it to pass. But even if the reasonable 13 year old would have set off across the road, they'd have kept the car under observation, noticed it approaching at speed, and gone a bit faster to get it, and got, so got across in time. So there was a finding of contributory negligence. The judge held that given the blameworthiness of the defendant who was driving accordingly, it was just and equitable to reduce the claimant's damages by just 10%. Now, that finding of contributory negligence of 10% was unusual. It's perhaps instructive to note that the defendant's counsel in that case had submitted that a range of 10 to 20% would be appropriate. He didn't aim any higher. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the claimant appealed, and the Court of Appeal identified that the three questions arose. First, was the claimant at fault? Second, causation. Okay, did the claimant suffer damage partly as a result of his fault? Third, if so, to what extent is it just and equitable to reduce his damages? And the appellant argued uh, that the claimant's misjudgment in relation to the speed of the car was not blameworthy. But the Court of Appeal held that the judge was entitled to conclude that the misjudgment in crossing the road was indeed culpable or blameworthy. And then on the question as to was it just and equitable to reduce his damages, the Court of Appeal recognised that there were limited circumstances in which an appellate court could interfere with the degree of reduction, as Kate just mentioned, and that was looked at by the Supreme Court in the case of Jackson and Murray, which we're going to remind ourselves about in a moment. The Court of Appeal held in Google that 10% was unusually low, but was not outside the range of reasonable determinations, and there was nothing in the 1945 Act or any authority to preclude a finding of 10%, so the appeal was dismissed. In Jackson and Murray, a 13-year-old girl stepped out from behind a school minibus into the path of an oncoming car in poor lighting conditions, which the judge held made it difficult for her to assess the speed of the car, which was too fast in the circumstances. Now, this was a Scottish case, and there is some suggestion in the textbooks that traditionally the Scottish courts have been more robust in making findings of contributory negligence against children. 
Certainly in this case, at first instance, there was a finding of 90% contributory negligence for the child. On appeal, that had been reduced to 70%. And then the Supreme Court looked at the case and held that there was no satisfactory explanation of the court's conclusion that a major share of responsibility should be attributed to the child claimant and held that the proper assessment was 50%. So we have quite similar facts, 13 year old child stepping out and not assessing speed. And in Jackson and Murray, we've got a, a reduction of 50% and in Google, 10%. The approach that for appellate courts was looked at by Lord Reed, uh, and he said this, he recognised that it was not possible for a court to arrive at an, an apportionment which was demonstrably correct, that apportionment was inevitably a somewhat rough and ready exercise, differing views of judges should be respected within the limits of reasonable disagreement. So an appellate court would need to be satisfied that the apportionment was outside the range of reasonable determinations. And so when the Court of Appeal in Google and McDonough were applying that, they found that 10% was not outside the range of reasonable determinations. I want to take you now to the case of Ellis and Kelly, uh, which was a, a case involving a younger child, a child of eight. This was a decision of Mrs. Justice Yip in 2018. And the child was hit by a speeding car as he ran across a road close to a pedestrian crossing. The judge inferred that his previous experience was that cars would stop at the crossing, although I didn't think there was direct evidence of that. And she held that at his age, he was unable to judge that the car was traveling too fast to stop. She found that there was no contributory negligence. And she also found that there was no contribution to be had from the mother for allowing the child out without supervision. The defendant had argued that if the child was not responsible, than his mother was for letting him out to use the road on his own. And the reason for seeking that contribution from the mother was to try to defeat the claim for her gratuitous care provided to the severely injured child as a result of the accident. Now, as I've mentioned, the, child, the judge found that there was no contributory negligence. And she rather elided the three questions that the Court of Appeal has reminded us need to be answered, fault, causation, and then whether it's just and equitable to make a reduction. She found that this was a case of momentary misjudgment balanced against reckless conduct on the part of the defendant and simply found that it wouldn't be just and equitable to make a finding of contributory negligence in the circumstances. She also set out her view that it would be undesirable for law to expand so as to routinely attempt to regulate decisions and actions arising in the course of normal daily parenting. And as I said, the claim for contribution against the parent failed. However, in other cases, there may well be scope for seeking a contribution from a parent where a child sustained such an injury, particularly if the parent was on the scene. And it's certainly a point to be considered where there is a significant care claim. Then finally, and I mean this in the sense of approaching the end, there is the case of Alabadi and Akram, which was heard last autumn. And this was a child of nine who was crossing a three-lane carriageway at a light-controlled crossing in a group with her mother and three cousins. It was rather late at night, I think about 10.30 p.m., and the group were crossing on a red man signal. During the crossing, the claimant was about two metres ahead of the group when she was struck by a car. The rest of the group had stopped as the car approached. The car driver, driver thought that he had the time and space to continue because the group had stopped and he had uh, the third lane to use, and of course the light was in his favour. The judge found that the claimant must have been distracted and that she didn't notice the car, nor that the rest of the group had stopped. And it was held that the claimant, the child, was not at fault for crossing on the red man's signal, and, and that a child of her age, nine, would naturally work on the basis that it was safe to follow the lead of her adult cousin and her mother, and that when she was on the crossing, her momentary lapse of concentration did not amount to fault, and that it would not be reasonable to expect a girl of her age to keep such a close eye on the group, so there was no contributory negligence. Interestingly, there does not seem to have been any claim in this case for contribution from the mother. And the judge added this, uh, that had his decision called for apportionment, he said, I would have reached the firm conclusion, bearing in mind Khadija's age and all the circumstances of the case, 
that the reduction in damages would have been minimal and that at most 10%. I would have regarded such a reduction as de minimis. I would therefore, in any event, have made no reduction in cathedral's damages. Now, that decision was a month before the appeal rule, which affirmed, as we know, a reduction of 10%. So going forward, in the light of rule, it will now be difficult for judges to say that a reduction of 10% would be de minimis. And it will also be difficult to assert in negotiations that a finding of 10% contributory negligence is improbable. And of course, in a case involving very severe injuries, a reduction of 10% can represent a significant amount of money. So it may be that arguments about contributory negligence in children will now be pursued with a little more vigour. I hope that this review of recent cases has been of benefit. That does bring me to the end of my talk, and it brings us to the end of the seminar. Thank you very much indeed.